All right, hello everybody. Welcome. Uh, my name is Eric Kalita. I'm a developer programs engineer working on Google Apps Script. Uh, my name is Matt Ziegelbaum. I'm a software engineer and I work on Google Forms. And today, we're going to show you how you can take this simple, scalable data collection of Google Forms and combine it with the powerful integrated automation of Apps Script to eliminate a lot of the manual processes, the annoying workflows you have to do in your daily routine. But first, let's take a look back at kind of where we've come from. So I guess maybe sometimes we all feel a bit like this, uh, sitting in a room processing paper. Uh, this is the Sears Roebuck uh, Fulfillment Center uh, entry department from about 100 years ago. This postcard's from 1916, uh, and it kind of illustrates how far we've come. Uh, back at the turn of the century, Sears figured out that you could turn form processing into an assembly line. Uh, they filled rooms throughout the country with people who had to move forms from point A to point B uh, at various time points, uh, and it cut their error margins, it increased the profitability, it made their customers happy, uh, but it's, it's really manual. And moving forward today, this is fairly standard, right? Enterprise software, you build these big enterprise systems, uh, they do your order fulfillment, your user comes to your website, you click a button, uh, all of a sudden, it's in, the warehouse gets the order, it ships out. Uh, but it's still, it's big, uh, it requires a lot of costly engineering work, uh, and you can do better. Yeah, and the truth is there's a lot of problems that don't, aren't solved by using a really big system. For, for lack of a better term, uh, I'm gonna refer to these as mini workflows, right? So these are processes that you have that are often maybe very small in scope. Uh, so sometimes we try to plan a team dinner, right? I'm not gonna build an enterprise application for a team dinner. Um, other times, they're just limited time frame, right? So let's say you're doing an event registration. When that event is over in a couple weeks, no longer is that entire workflow system necessary, so it doesn't make sense to invest too much in it. Uh, and lastly, sometimes there's just processes that are really rapidly changing. So think crisis response. You're on the ground, and you need to quickly adapt your workflow to what's happening. Uh, and having something kind of big, clunky, and hard-baked is just not gonna scale to what you need it to do. Now, we use different kinds of technology today to address these problems. And I think one of the first things that people turn to is email, right? What's great about email is that it really requires the minimal effort out of all the things we're gonna talk about. You just start typing and hit the send button and your workflow is off and running. Uh, and the other great thing about it is that the technology is really familiar. Even your least technical user in your organization has an inbox and knows how to work it. Otherwise, they, they probably wouldn't be employed there any longer. Um, but, you know, once you kind of scale a workflow like this to something beyond just a handful of users, it really turns into complete chaos. Trying to collect all that data, organize it, even handle edits, you know, people change their response later. Trying to process all of that in email really breaks down, and I think people quickly realize this is not the way to go for something that has any degree of complexity. Now, where a lot of people turn to next, and an obvious choice, is spreadsheets, right? Spreadsheets are a great tool for doing kind of data organization and collection, mostly because it's structured, right? So unlike email, you can define columns and rows, you can organize your data into different fields, really adds some much needed structure to what you're doing. And although it's a little bit more complicated than email, it's still relatively simple to set up. Now, I find that people, when they're working on a spreadsheet, they'll probably spend more time getting the background colors just the way they want than they actually do on the rows and columns and the important bits. Um, but, you know, once again, there's still a problem here, and that it's, it's somewhat error-prone. So we use Google Sheets, obviously, inside Google for all of our work. And I've been in Sheets, open before, that have hundreds of little cursors flying around, adding rows, changing cells, overriding what I just entered. You know, it's still kind of dangerous because all the data is available to, for everybody to both view and edit, and so it really doesn't scale to a, a more complex kind of mini workflow. Now, I imagine a bunch of us here in the room are software developers. And so our natural inclination when we see a problem like this is, I can just build an application, right? I, I know how to do it, I could spin up a database and a server, no, lickety-split, not a problem, right? Uh, actually, I have a colleague, Kalyan, no matter what problem I tell him in my life, he, he always says that with just a weekend of coding and maybe an Arduino, he could solve it. You know, it doesn't matter how complex the problem is. Um, and, and the truth is, there are some benefits to custom applications, right? You can tailor your application to ex your exact needs, right? Just expose the data you want, just collect the data you want, have the exact sequences and branching. So it's really perfect for getting, you know, the exact solution that you would like to have. 
Um, and you know, if you build it on the right technologies, you know, it can easily scale to thousands of users. The scalability problem for number of users really goes away. But there, there's a cost here and a problem that isn't always obvious at first, and that's the long-term maintenance, right? So uh, just by a show of hands, how many people here have built an application for a friend or colleague that they swore was like a two-week project, and it's like years later, and you're still supporting it, right? Yeah, a lot of hands went up there, right? You're getting the calls, can you add a label, can you add a field, right? You gotta remember a password to a system you probably long ago forgot, right? There's an ongoing cost to these custom applications that doesn't make sense in more of these kind of mini workflow scenarios. But at Google, we think we have a better option for addressing it. Yeah, so we think that option is Google Forms. Uh, Google Forms started in 2008 as a feature of Google Spreadsheets, uh, and we wrote it to address problems like this, where you had a lot of information you needed to collect, say, going to dinner, uh, and you had too many users, and there just wasn't a great way to, to plan well. Uh, Google Forms is perfect for these short, uh, kind of flexible solutions that you need to create on the fly. Uh, just crisis response is perfect. Teachers love it. Um, just recently, after the Boston bombings, the community actually threw together two forms and sent them out to the world. Uh, one form for people who got stuck uh, because of grounded flights and couldn't leave the city and didn't have anywhere to stay. And the other form for people who could provide housing. And kind of ad hoc, they set up uh, an on-the-fly solution uh, and got everyone a place to stay. Uh, they got first responders food, and it was all through using this simple technology. Um, in, in February, we launched a new version of Google Forms. Uh, it's much richer. It looks like docs, sheets, and slides. It supports real-time collaboration, uh, and it scales better than the old version did. So as Sundar noted this morning, uh, apps for education is, is huge. Uh, and teachers are some of our most enthusiastic forms users. Uh, they just, they love it. Um, they work to create quizzes and uh, parent feedback forms and all of these things that just make their lives so much easier but it's all manual. If a student joins the class halfway through the year uh, and they add it to their roster spreadsheet, it's not in all of their forms. Uh, and that's, it's, it's hard. Teachers don't have infinite time and their resources are already stretched and they really need more automation. They want to be able to quickly create quizzes. They want to send feedback forms to parents to find out what they can do better. Uh, there's just a whole slew of things uh, that they need to do. And luckily, Google has had a solution for automating things with Google Apps for years. And that's Google Apps Script. So some of you might already know what Google Apps Script is, uh, judging from the talk title. But if you haven't heard of it, there's just basically a few takeaways uh, about what Apps Script is. So the first is that it's JavaScript in the cloud. What that means is you're writing JavaScript code, but you're writing it in an online editor that gets stored on Google storage and then runs on Google hardware. Um, and so since all of this is taking place in the cloud, it really requires no setup whatsoever. So right now, you could open a web browser to script.google.com and start coding immediately. No IDE, no binaries, no configuration or setup steps. Uh, it's really a lightweight way to get coding in a Google Apps environment. Um, and the other great thing about it is that it gives you really easy access to all your data. So we have connectors into a lot of different Google services, Gmail, Calendar, Docs and Drive, so you can pull out your Google data and start doing interesting things with it. But we also have connectors into outside technologies and outside data. So you can interface with third-party APIs. You can interface with the legacy systems that you have. Um, and it's a really great way to kind of bring all of your data together and then take action and extend Google Apps. Now, I don't have it in the slide, but there's a fourth thing I'd recommend you remember about AppScript. It's please do not refer to it as gas. Uh, my colleague Arun really bugs him that he's like the lead developer advocate on gas, but uh, that's, a small, that's a small point. Um, now we've had Google Apps Script in Google Sheets and Google Sites for a number of years now. It's been really popular. And just yesterday, we were so happy to announce that Apps Script is now in Google Forms as well. There we go. All right, so we really think this opens up a whole lot of great potential for solving these mini workflow problems and getting these manual tasks completely automated. Um, now, so what does it mean to have Google scripts and forms? Well, the first thing you'll notice right away is in the forms designer, there's a new menu, tools, script editor. This is how you jump right in to creating a script 
for your form. Uh, the, you can just start coding right away, and it provides you really easy access to the currently open form, so you can start taking action on it. And really, it bundles together the script and the form, so that you know, if you were to copy that form or share it with someone, the script moves along with it. So it's a really great way to take a workflow, a mini workflow solution, bundle it up, and move it along. Now, what, is it, what can you actually do now that you have a script in your form? Well, there's basically three main ways that we're integrated with forms. The first is the ability to create, open, and edit forms programmatically using App Script. Second is to enhance the form designer with your own custom user interface components. And third is to react to form submissions and carry that into another action. So let's take a look at create, open, and edit. Uh, the most important thing that we wanted to give to you uh, in this new API is that if you can do something in the form designer, you should be able to do it in App Script. So we worked really hard to make sure all of that functionality is there. Uh, you can manage your forms. You can uh, change basically everything about them from their confirmation message to the choices of a checkbox field to whether or not the form is currently accepting responses. Uh, and this opens up a whole slew of things. Uh, you can generate new forms programmatically. Uh, if you had those quizzes that you need to send to your students, you can do that now. Uh, if you want to make dinner plans using a form and you have to plan a dinner once a month for someone's birthday, all of a sudden you can click a button and, and make that happen. So just taking a quick look at some, some code snippets, you can see here uh, we have FormApp. And FormApp is the new service to interact with Google Forms. Services are App Script's way of interacting with Google services. Uh, we already had document app, spreadsheet app, uh, Gmail app, and a whole, whole bunch of others. Uh, so FormApp should be familiar. Uh, if you're familiar with the script editor already, uh, just type FormApp and a period, and you'll get the nice autocomplete you expect from App Script. Uh, moving on, uh, setting values. Uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday are the days I can go to dinner. We're not going to dinner when I can't go because I'm organizing this. Uh, and finally, sending it over to the team is really easy uh, using the mail app. Uh, and you know, just a couple of lines, we've, we've sent out a script. All right, so that's creating, opening, and editing. But the next thing we want to take a look at is enhancing the form designer itself. So there's basically three types of things you can enhance. The first is you can add your own custom menus into the menu bar that blend in seamlessly with the menus that are already there. Secondly, you can show simple prompts and alerts, little pop-ups that allow your user to collect information from your user or show them some little small piece of information. And then if you want to build a more rich form of interaction, you can actually design your own UIs, your own um, more complex, custom-built user interfaces, and expose those as a dialogue or even in the sidebar. And the sidebar is especially great when you're designing a form because you can keep your information up while taking action. Now, what that allows you to do, I think first and foremost, is kind of make macros, right? So you may find yourself in the form designer doing the same kind of repetitive tasks over and over again. Things like, you know, refreshing the values in a list like Matt mentioned before, um, or maybe some sort of sorting or some sort of updating task. You know, like you said, if maybe you had a form previously that you were changing a few, uh, some text on every week. Now you can automate that. Um, and sh taking that script and actually exposing it via a menu item makes it a lot more approachable to non-technical users, right? We, we found that a lot of users, the act of opening a script and hitting the little run button, that just scares them away. They see code and they're out the door. But when you expose it via a menu item, they don't even need to know that this is not a built-in feature. And so it's very approachable. And then the other thing you can do with enhancing the UI is bring forward relevant data, right? So when you're designing a form, it may be helpful to have right built into that interface, uh, if you're a teacher, a list of your classes or students, or in your organization, perhaps you could even just show uh, your calendar or your, your Gmail, you know, some information that when you're designing a form would be really nice to have, not only to see, but then to take action with in a complex way. So now let's go back to this dinner planning example we've been showing you thus far. And let's say we have our form built that we had generated in the previous code sample, but now we wanna have some extra menu items there that allow me as the form maintainer to quickly get a sense of what the responses are like thus far. So I've injected an extra menu here called extras, uh, and the code to do so is pretty simple. It's basically just passing in some strings, which is the text that should appear in the menu, as well as the function that should be run when that menu item is clicked. So it's very simple just to tie together your code and a menu. 
So the two menu items I've added here is one to kind of show me based on all the responses what's the best day thus far based on everyone's submissions. And then maybe even just show me a chart if I case I want to analyze, you know, the relative popularity of given days. So let's look at this first one, show best day. So I have some calculate best day method here using my super secret algorithm that I've not shown you. But essentially once you figure out what your best day is, to actually expose that to the user as an alert is basically just one long line of code. Uh, you can even set custom buttons, so you get, can have a little bit of control over OK, cancel, yes, no, things of that nature, and then even react to which button they choose. Um, now, the other menu item was to show a chart. Now, this is a little bit more of a richer interface, right? This is not just a string, so it requires you to use a custom dialog or sidebar. So in this case, I've built up uh, a user interface using the HTML service. Now, this is a little bit uh, more complicated, and so I haven't shown the code here, but we have some really great documentation in our developer docs that show you exactly how to use the HTML service. So once you've gotten your HTML page built up and your application is wired and ready to go, to actually show it to the user in the form designer is dead simple. It's just this one line, show dialog, passing in your finished HTML object. Uh, it's the same thing for show sidebar as well. And so, you know, in this case, I used some very, very crude HTML and CSS to draw a little bar chart, but you can imagine the possibilities that once you have, you know, the full HTML, JavaScript, uh, CSS stack in front of you, the kind of rich user interfaces you could build directly into Google Forms. So finally, we can now react to submissions. Uh, if you're familiar with the spreadsheets bean, uh, the form submit has always been there, but it hasn't been great. It's not rich. Uh, it's just been a key value store. And so now uh, you can still detect when a user has submitted a form, and you can read the data of the response, but you get a new rich response object out of it. Uh, so you can build complicated workflows that react to submissions. You can send responses based on the other response. You can build forms based on forms based on forms. So back to dinner. Uh, you can see here a trigger. And if you're not familiar with them, triggers are App Script's way of hooking up one of your custom functions to an event. So for every response that's submitted, this onFormSubmit function will be called. Looking at the response from a user, you can see that the response is easily parsed. You can get their email out, uh, and you can see which days they're available. You can very easily, using the document app, put their response into a document that everyone who has responded can see. Simplifying your life, because you're no longer the one person who knows all of the information, uh, and giving everyone this simple access to this information. All right, so we've shown you the three basic components here that you can, uh, of the interaction that you can do with Google Forms. Create, open, and edit, enhance the designer, and react to submissions. Now we're gonna go through a little demo showing how we put them all together to address a real live use case. Uh, so something that's become popular in college, uh, a little after my time though, is these clickers. I don't know how many people have seen these before, but essentially it's a way for a teacher to kind of really quickly poll their students, uh, kind of giving them an on-the-fly quiz. So they can ask a question, students in the, have a clicker in their hand and just push A, B, or C, and then the teacher gets a readout with, you know, how many students were correct, how many people were actually getting the lecture, right? Uh, now, there's obviously a cost involved here, and a lot of public schools, they don't have the money to buy these for all their classrooms. And so one of our colleagues, uh, Zach Yeskel, he's a PM focused on education within Google, the EDU market, uh, and actually a former teacher himself. Uh, he, he saw our new integration, and he thought this could be a way to solve that problem that's completely free and built on Google Apps. Uh, and so we're going to go and show that demo now. The basic idea that he had was, what if you could create a form that allowed you to generate forms, right? Kind of that meta universe that Matt was talking about. So what we've built here is the quick quiz creator. So this is a form that the teacher would fill out to on the fly generate a new quiz to distribute to their students. So Matt's gonna fill out a, an IO quiz here. Um, so you put, give it a name and a description. Those are obviously optional. And then there's a bunch of different text boxes that allow you to specify the questions and then multiple choice answers. Uh, and the nice thing about this, kind of like, you could obviously create a custom UI that did all of this, right? Collecting data from the teacher. But 
once again, it highlights that a teacher will be really familiar with Google Forms itself. And so going in and creating a quiz via a form is actually a low training, low effort way of getting all of that data. And allows them to, you know, right after their class is over, to run, or after the session, uh, the lecture is over, to get, sit down, throw a quiz together, and distribute it in just a matter of seconds. Uh, so at the bottom here, we're selecting which of our classes we want to submit this to, and we have a little other box as well. And then once you hit submit, you get a little message saying that your quiz is being created, and this is where the app script picks up. So now we're in the part of our script that's actually reacting to a form submission. We detected this submission, and we're reacting. And what our action is going to be is a couple things. We're building a brand new form on the fly based on that form's responses, and then we are sending out that form to the teacher. Now we're sending it to the teacher first because the teacher needs to give us the correct answers, right? And so once again, we're using a form as a way to get that information. So here, Matt, as the teacher, is going to go in and fill out the correct answers for his quiz. So now this second form, not the original form, this second form was just submitted, but we also captured that event. So we have the ability to have a single script react to the events of multiple different forms. Uh, it's getting a little complex, I know, but it's pretty cool. So now that that is done, we should get an email here. And the second one on the right is the student. So this is a separate account in CS101, uh, which obviously is very concerned with my shirt color. <laughs> and uh, now the student gets an email saying, you've got a new quiz that you need to take. So they see the same form again, but now they're choosing what their answers are to the quiz. Uh, they're taking the quiz. And they're not paying attention. <laughs> they're apparently quite wrong. Now, so that's great. So now we have the student filling out the form, the teacher's got the correct answers, everything's generated, but how do we then see how the class is doing, what the responses are like thus far? So this is where we've then used the Enhance the Designer integration that we talked about before to add our own custom menu called Quiz Results. Uh, and it just has one function, Show Sidebar, which is going to pop up a sidebar that shows the results of your quiz thus far. So this is a custom UI that we built using the HTML service. And you can see there's our IO quiz. And in just a moment, OK. So th these zeros obviously do not render quite as well. But if we give it some correct answers, there we go. Now we're getting some percentages. So we're drawing a little bars and updating the values about what the percentage correct is on these uh, different quizzes. So it's pretty cool. So as a teacher, you really quickly, in just a matter of moments, right, you just thought of the quiz just after finishing your lecture, filled out the form, filled out the correct answers, sent it to your students, and have live feedback about how they're doing. Now, we're actually interested in seeing this happen live for the whole room, so we prepared ahead of time a quiz. Yeah, so if you have a laptop out or you have your phone, uh, get it ready. Uh, we have made this quiz for you. Uh, it's very hard. Uh, you have to figure out if someone is a touring award winner or if it's Ikea furniture. <laughs> uh, we've made the, the link, a uh, short link for you. Uh, it's large. If you can't read it, it's goo.gl slash lowercase t, capital P, 8, capital C, capital H. So you can drag that to the side. So move it out of the way. There we go. All right. So. As responses start streaming in, we should see this start to update. Now, I know you, you actually took this quiz multiple times. I've taken this quiz multiple times, but I still get things wrong occasionally. <laughs> yeah, it is harder than it looks. Getting those answers in. Right, are you guessing again? I'm guessing again. Just a moment, we're going to use the mics for questions. Uh, not quite streaming in there, huh? Not quite. <laughs> we're, we're going to show the sidebar again and see if we can load it up for us. Sure. Close that dialog too. I think we're screwing it up. The perils of live demos. Yeah. I mean, if the keynote can't do it, what chance do we have, right? <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to keep this up during the question and answer portion. So hopefully we can revisit back to what your answers are. But it is actually pretty cool that, you know, we can collect all this information really quickly, show it right into the designer, and kind of have just one simple interface for a teacher to do 
these results. Oh, here we go. Still nothing, though. Wait, wait. Oh, nope. there we go. And there we go. 127. Wow, that was fast. Yeah, you guys are fast. Yeah. All right. I think the correct answer is, actually, I don't know. People are still submitting, so I don't want to, I don't want to ruin it. We'll, we'll get to the correct answers during the question and answer at the end. All right. Back to slides. Yeah. All right. So the, the takeaway from our presentation, once again, is that forms allows you to do simple and scalable data collection. And then when you combine that with AppScript, our integrated, powerful automation, you can really do some amazing things in a very low-tech way and in a way that's very friendly to everybody. So I'm sure you're all as excited about this as we are. Uh, and you're probably wondering how you can get started. So yesterday, we put up uh, a forms quick start. It's a, an easy five-minute tutorial. If you've ever done any of the app script quick starts, it should be pretty familiar. Uh, and you can get there by going to developers.google.com slash apps dash script. Uh, it should be right at the top of the page when you load it up. Second, as Eric mentioned earlier, you already have app script installed. So head to script.google.com and, and get going. Just try writing something. And finally, write something cool. I'm sure some ideas are bubbling. Uh, you've come up with something maybe just while watching us. Uh, and if you write something cool and you come by the app sandbox and show us, we'd like to see it. And if we like it, you'll get a t-shirt. Yeah, these are some really cool looking t-shirts, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much. Uh, and we're going to do some question and answer. Uh, if you could try to come up to the mics uh, for the Q&A, that'd be great. Uh, yes. Uh, okay, so I had two. One, when you create a form programmatically, um, is every form persisted, or do you have a way to define whether it's temporary or just that once, or is it, does it live forever? Hmm. Uh, every form is persisted. It'll show up in, in your drive, um, oh, okay. uh, but you can use the, the drive app to uh, delete forms that, that you no longer need. Uh, you can do it through drive itself. OK. Yeah, it is possible to kind of script the finding of, of forms that you have, as well as the, like, the maintenance of them, moving into folders, deleting them, et cetera. And how would you say one should determine where kind of the usage cutoff is here? You know, a, a little five-person business as opposed to trying to use this on a massive scale. Where, where do you kind of, where would we want to cut that off? Right. Yeah, I mean, defining these mini workflows, you know, I've, I kind of made up the term myself. Figuring out where the right technology is, is part of the challenge, right? There is a point in which a custom application makes sense. Um, but I think there is a large middle ground, right? I've seen some very complex form-related workflows, uh, tiers and tiers of forms that all interact with each other. Uh, and it's certainly, you know, you have to weigh the pros and cons. But I, I think that it's a pretty meaty area to tackle with forms. All right, go over here. You, you said the... Uh... You, you inserted the script at the form level, but you can insert it in any of the other ways where we can create scripts. So I could have it in a web app, I could have it in a spreadsheet, right. or is it only limited there? And if it's not limited there, where do you trap the on-form submit event in that case? Gotcha. Um, so regardless of where the, the script lives, whether it's attached to a, a form or not, uh, you can use the script app's trigger builders uh, to listen to forms. So you can have one script listening to many forms uh, response events. Yeah, so yeah, you could use, uh, and I think we have some, some demos you've done in the past of mm -hmm. a spreadsheet bound script creating forms, or oh, yeah, a web app deployed script creating forms. It's really kind of not tied. But when you are tied to a form, it makes it a lot easier to access that form. We have a function get active form, which just automatically finds and accesses the form it's attached to. Over the side. Thanks. Um, so one of the things that you guys had on your uh, dinner form was. Uh, you're kind of putting in your information. And uh, that's actually a common thing that I see all the time as well. Like, okay, what's your name, your email address? Is there any like direction, or maybe there is already a feature um, to just sign in, like with your Google Plus or something, and just say like, okay, well, this form is, you have to sign in to use it, and then so take it from there? Right now, uh, if you are a Google Apps for your domain user or a Apps for Education user, uh, and you can enforce, you can enforce uh, requiring sign-in and also collecting emails. 
Uh, if you're a, a, on a regular Gmail account, uh, you can't do that right now, but it is something that we've heard from our users and we're going to be looking into. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I had a couple questions. The email validation, because I was creating a form and then I realized it's an email address. Is, there, is that built into Google Forms? And can I use this to force it to look like an email address? Um, you know I mean? that, that's another big, big request from our users. Um, and with the new version of Forms that launched uh, just this past February, we're looking to add a lot more features uh, coming up. And so uh, it's something we're definitely looking at. Can I do it with Apps Script, with the integration? Yeah, no? so do, it, do I, I guess one, to that level? one point to clarify with how Apps Script and Forms interact is that you have access to a couple different events. You can tie into when the form designer is opened, when the form designer and edit takes place, and when someone finishes the last page of a form, when they hit the final submit. Okay. But you cannot currently use App Script in the intermediary processes of filling out a form. So when someone fills out a field doing a validation immediately, or when someone goes from one page to another, you don't have that kind of a tie-in. So it is possible to build a script that when a form is submitted, you scan the data, look yeah. for errors, and then send them a notification. Yeah, you yeah. cannot do that while they're still in the form filling out experience. But there is a plan to add, because there's a whole bunch of validate cases that are missing in Google Forms, right? Like email. Yeah. But, and then another question is, the um, payment, like, is there integration with Google Wallet or something? Can you use this? You talked about event registration. Uh, you could actually use this integrated with Google Wallet, have them fill out their name, and then pay, too. Uh, is that? possible It's interesting. Today? Not today, no. I don't think. Not today. And, what are, and another question is mobile. It, does Google Forms already has built it. Like if I'm on a mobile device, I get a different look. Like if, let's say there's 20 uh, questions, right? On mobile, it already, it, there's already a mobile, ver like, right? It yeah, so yeah. We, we already have a mobile version of the, the form response page. Uh, it uses mobile-friendly CSS and CSS. HTML. Uh, and things like our new date picker are, are using the HTML5 date picker. So it works really well on, on iPhones, Android devices, uh, using the native OS-level pickers. That's really good. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yes, over here. Question. Um, so I'm interested in building an offline mobile client that talks to forms. I'm wondering if this uh, allows me to do that through some sort of just like a more reasonable API, or is Forms going to get an API at some point in the future? So we do have uh, an API in AppScript for constructing responses and submitting them. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a pretty good API. It doesn't require you to do what, in the past, you'd have to construct your own post request and send it to our server. Uh, now you can construct a first level uh, good rich response and, and submit it that way. But does that API allow me to pull down what the form spec actually is? So can I load that form on an offline client, fill it out, and then send it? Hmm. Because I can, right now, I can, presumably, I can just send a response. If I, but I don't, if I don't know what that form is, how do I do that? Yeah. Well, so, so AppScript, if you're using AppScript, at least, and, and uh, you can definitely read the structure of a form, okay. figure out what all the fields are, figure out what all the options are, and then also very easily construct a new response that you can then submit to that form. So there's some capabilities there. I don't know if it'll fit your exact use case, but it's, it's worth looking into. OK, thanks. Yeah. Over here. Kind of an aside to, um, to scripts itself. With form submittal, uh, is there going to be any future plans to restrict submittal to like circles, groups, and OUs? Is that something that we might be looking at in the future? Hmm. Instead um, of just kind of a global, you're either inside the organization or you're outside the organization. I'm just thinking specifically I, for education, where you could restrict to a student OU or a staff OU for those uh, kind of things. Right. Interesting. That's interesting. Uh, right now, we do only support the kind of organizational level restriction. Um, but it's definitely something interesting to look at okay. going yeah. forward. Thanks. Yeah, and once again, using App Script, it's not as ideal. But for instance, if you, monitor, if you required the email address of your user, you could then, after they submit the form, determine whether or not they are in a certain group, determine if they are in a certain circle. So you have to do it after the submission, but you can then perhaps invalidate that response or send them some sort of feedback. I'm just going to go to the microphone over here. So I know you're focused on many workflows, but sometimes forms can be pretty uh, lengthy and become medium <laughs> workflows. Uh, and uh, there's some value in users being able to save and come back. Do you have any best practice or suggestion or any way at all to support a user to save and come back, even if it required them authenticating? So I've actually, in playing with the API, written something that, that can do this using uh, custom using the UI app or HTML service uh, to build my own version of the form uh, with a little key that I made up 
that allows the user to come back with it. Uh, but we don't have anything that's first party as part of AppScript right. and, and Forms itself. And you couldn't do that with the regular Forms because you don't get to run your JavaScript while the form is being filled out. Correct. Right. So no good way right now. All right, thanks. Beautiful. Through over here. So I'm going to speak more from a startup standpoint. Let's say you, you already mentioned about the education part. Yeah. So assistants or professors need students to fill forms, right? So let's say they don't have any technical skills to create those forms, and you create up a UI where they can um, create their own UI quizzes, etc. So my question is going to be: Can the a is the API that um, good to create such elements on the fly? Meaning, they will pick the questions, fill the forms. They want radio buttons or select boxes, etc. Then we will talk to the API and create those elements for them. Yeah. And then the emails that they will they they will receive the response to can this be also set separately from my account? Let's say I have a Google account, but they don't. They will provide their email addresses, and they want to collect their responses to that email. Yeah, I, I say that the sounds like we're flexible enough to handle all of that. I mean, the key takeaway I think for what the form app can do is currently everything that you can do in the UI. So if there's check boxes in the UI. There's check in the designer. There's check boxes in AppScript. But can this be created by the API? That's my question. They want to create something, and I'm as a developer. I'm just providing the service. They will pick the elements, pick it, um, you know, place it on a UI. Then yeah. I will take this UI, programmatically, uh, programmat uh, programmatically, I'm going to create it on the fly through the API. Right. And yeah, I, I think you know what we showed today in our demo was using a form as that custom UI. But you could build your own separate UI. That's let's say tailored to that specific kind of problem you're solving, mm -hmm. where they just enter a lot less information. And then you take that information from your custom UI and use it to create a form. So I think there's definitely all the tools and the pieces are there to allow you to do that. Thanks. Yeah. Um, you've been mentioning the HTML service, and, and I'm not familiar with that before at all before today. And someone else just mentioned JavaScript. Can you use that HTML service to inject any client side to do validation of your own and things like that right there in the browser? Right. As we were talking a little bit about this problem, it's definitely something a lot of people want, is to do that validation during the fill out flow. And so we're, I think we're going to think more about it. But currently today, the only time we can inject is either is after the form submitted. So it is a little limiting. You can't today use the HTML service within or use the JavaScript capabilities within the form filling out flow. But I think some of the right technologies are there. We just got to see if they all fit together. Yeah, I work for a school, and we have a lot of external systems. And one of the biggest questions I'm going to have is, what kind of third-party system can it integrate with? Does it need a certain API? Does it need to be RESTful? Can it, what right. are the limitations there? Yeah, so the, the kind of different connectors that we use and that are, pos are, are popular. The biggest one is URL fetch app. This allows you to make any sort of GET post request. You can pass your own custom headers. You can, therefore, interact with kind of any HTTP-based API, any REST API. Um, so it's kind of, you know, the sky's the limit there. You have to actually do the HTTP requests. So you have to have some understanding of that. But uh, that opens it up to a really large number of APIs. Uh, we do have support for OAuth 1 currently. And uh, we have some sample code showing how you can use OAuth 2-based APIs. Um, and then we also provide connectors for uh, SQL. So we have a JDBC connector that allows you to connect to SQL databases. And then we also have a, a SOAP connector. If you have a really old legacy SOAP service, uh, you're probably unhappy that you still have that service. But you can connect to it via AppScript. Is there any plan for maybe an Oracle JDBC connector? Yeah, so I think the JDBC we have today, if I remember correctly, is Oracle, MySQL, MS SQL. Um, so yeah, you should be good. Uh, now that you can uh, send somebody a document which executes a script, doesn't that open a security risk? Uh, security risk. Um, I don't, no. I mean, no, I don't think so. Uh, I mean, especially within an organization, if you check the checkbox that says only people within my organization can fill it out, I mean, that definitely limits the scope down a lot. But the other thing, I guess, is just being wary that if you have a public form and you have a script that's reacting to it, that you understand what you're doing. And one, I guess one of the key points about the triggers that we didn't go into too much detail on is that when Matt creates a trigger on his form, the trigger always runs as Matt's identity. So you're never taking the identity of the person filling out the form. You don't have access to that. That is separate. So anyone in the world can fill out your form with or without a Google account. Their information is separate and safe. The trigger, when it runs, it runs as Matt. It has access to Matt's calendar, Matt's drive, Matt's docs. 
Hi. Hi. Um, just one question, also complement one of your answers. Um, one question is, do you think that you're going to have a field sooner or later which allows you to link to a Google Doc or upload a file of some sort and store it in a Drive folder or something like that? Gotcha. Upload. Upload? Yeah. Uh, that would definitely be cool. Uh, people have asked for it in the past, so it's definitely something we've, we've considered. Um, but right we, now, we, not, we don't. Ha it's not right. launched right okay. now. And also, just to um, comment on one of your answers before, about to figure out whether um, how to scale this. To what point is it OK for a small organization or, or go huge scale? Um, the limitation there is on the processing time. Okay, you have limitations on, on app script. I can't remember the exact numbers. I think it's like 60 minutes or something yeah, a day like, or something. Yeah. And after that, you would need to scale up to uh, App Engine or something like that. Yeah, so I mean, so app script does have some limitations. Uh, I think the, what you're referring to is about a five or six minute um, processing time on a script reaction. So if you're doing more than five or six minutes worth of work, you either have to try to batch it up in some sort of a way or maybe turn to another solution. Um, but uh, so I think there's, there are going to be a times, and I think it's true with all technologies, there's a time when you eventually grow out of it. So I tried to show the progression from email to spreadsheet to something else, right? Uh, you know, I think people, the natural and I think probably correct tendency is to do the simplest thing that solves your problem today, and then when you grow out of it, migrate to another solution, right? I don't think there's any solution I've ever seen in technology where it works just as well for the simplest case as it does for the best case, right? There's always going to be the need to kind of revise it, revamp it, and restructure it as the problem space grows. Um, and so I, I think with forms and app script, you're all going to find that maybe someday, if it blows up and it's the most popular form we've ever seen, that you may need to change some things that you're doing. Um, but uh, I'd say, you know, when you think about the problems that you have, you'll start to see ones that make sense with forms and app script. Hi. Um, I've got a slightly more general question about app script. Sure. Uh, one of the benefits that's often touted is that you don't need an IDE to use it, but uh, I'm quite attached to my IDE. <laughs> is there any way to upload or download app scripts outside of just copy and paste in the browser? Yeah, that's a very popular request we've gotten. People have definitely have been asking for that. Uh, we've gotten some of the bits in place right now. It's not fully baked, but hopefully in the coming uh, weeks and months, we'll have some more good news about that for you. Thank you. All right, I'm sorry, last question in yellow because we're out of time. Uh, cherry one off with someone else's question. With app scripts in general, could you fire off some sort of um, set of code that says creates a Google Drive folder and email somebody a link to that to provide an upload process kind of indirectly that way? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, actually, yeah, talking about upload, it's not going to be in the form. So it's not going to be a little browse button just yet. But because we have all of these different connectors into sending emails, into getting URLs, into creating shared folders. I think there is some capabilities to kind of solve it in more of a roundabout way. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming today. We had a great time. Once again, please come by the Chrome and Apps booth. Say hello to us. Show us your script. Get an awesome t-shirt. Thanks again.